Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. In his book, Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner, Daniel Ellsberg ends with some recommendations. He proposes that the United States, first of all, commit to a no first use policy for nuclear weapons. Two, probing investigative hearings on our war plans, especially in the light of nuclear winter. Three, eliminating ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Next, foregoing delusions of preemptive damage limiting by our first strike forces. Giving up the profits, jobs, and alliance hegemony based on maintaining that pretense and otherwise dismantling the American doomsday machine. Both parties, as currently constituted, oppose every one of these measures. This mortal predicament did not begin with Donald J. Trump and it will not end with his departure. The obstacles to achieving these necessary changes are posed not so much by the majority of the American public, though many in recent years have shown dismaying manipulability, but by officials and elites in both parties and major institutions that consciously support militarism, American hegemony, and arms production and sales. Now joining us again is the former nuclear war planner and now uh, uh, activist for undoing nuclear war planning, Daniel Ellsberg. Thanks for joining us again. Good to be here. Thank you. These proposals, uh, let's go through them sort of one by one, but I want to start with, with the issue of nuclear winter. You call for congressional hearings into the issue of nuclear winter. Um, when you look at the Pentagon and what they're planning, uh, a brand new form of nuclear bomb, they're calling it the, the B-61-12, which is supposed to be like all kinds of different nuclear bombs all wrapped into one from dr dr exploding on high to actually bur burrowing into the earth and exploding in the earth. Um, both Russia and the United States and China uh, developing hypersonic weapons, uh, airplanes that are supposed to be able to evade all forms of um, defense systems. Uh, both the United States, Russia, and China for that matter, but particularly the United States, which apparently is going to spend, what, a trillion dollars over the next 30 years, much of it in the next 10 years. This, they're, they're, they're in all the major powers, and particularly the United States, are not acting like they believe nuclear winter is real. Uh, how controversial is it and what makes you believe it is real? And why is there a need for congressional hearings? Look, they're ignoring the reality of nuclear winter. It has nothing to do with raising doubts about it. Actually, uh, none of these countries have actually presented studies or done studies that would uh, even raise doubts about it. They just ignore it. And they do that because it's in their interest to the extent that it's in the interest to build these weapons, which in the light of nuclear winter, uh, serve no military purpose or national security purpose, whatever. So they, uh, there have in fact never been uh, hearings on the actual effects, even aside from smoke, of our nuclear uh, of our nuclear attack options or the difference that any of them might make. The big point about nuclear winter, by the way, is uh, on the one hand that it kills nearly everyone instead of nearly everyone in the northern hemisphere only. But is that a real moral difference? You know, to initiate the uh, hemispheric massacre uh, raises all the same moral issues as killing nearly everybody. The difference that it makes is that it means that going first makes absolutely no difference whatever from going second. And yet all of these countries, in particular the US and Russia, I should say, are, uh, have built their systems on the presumption that it is, however bad it is, to go first. Uh, and they don't have to. Uh, they don't have to pretend that that will be costless, but it's better than going second. Actually, it isn't plausible as that is. Uh, yes, our ICBMs, for example, could destroy many or most of Soviet ICBMs, fixed vulnerable missiles like that. Isn't that good to do away without those? No, because the Soviet submarines that we can't target with our intercontinental ballistic missiles, even if we do diminish them with our anti-submarine warfare, we'll still have more than enough missiles on our cities 
to destroy our society and actually to cause nuclear winter. So it doesn't make any difference. Uh, all that's involved is, as I say, the jobs, profits, donations on both sides, by the way, political influence, and the pretense with our allies, our allies in particular, that we still stand as their protector against a more or less non-existent threat from Russia now, or in the past, the Soviet Union, uh, but again, an illusory one in the sense that it depends on a promise, an assurance, and a readiness to initiate omnicide in the, attack, in the event that they are attacked. And from an American's point of view, even if there is no nuclear winter, the Northern Hemisphere is yes, gone and the United right. States is in the Northern that, Hemisphere. It doesn't actually make that difference uh, to what happens in America, although most of our weapons, like the B-61 Mod 12 and so forth, are all directed toward, in principle, in theory, reducing the number of weapons they can send and thus, in theory, reducing damage to the United States. It won't, even without smoke. The Soviet submarine missiles will destroy the United States. And the doctrine previously, and it would hard to believe it isn't the, still the doctrine, that if a war broke out with Russia, the United States also goes after China. There's no way the Americans are going to I don't know if that's still uh, necessarily the truth. Uh, but isn't it hard to imagine the United China States... I think China has every reason to worry that uh, we do not plan to leave them as the sole surviving superpower. They're not going to let China left standing yeah. with Russia and the United States taking each other out. Yeah. Why not? Well, not. Just not. You could say, don't you need, won't we need help? Well, really, there won't be much help from anybody. But what is the use of destroying everybody? What's the use of destroying the Russian culture, ability to re uh, reconstruct, whatever? No use, but um, maybe it'll deter them. We know there's a very strong uh, presence of evangelical Christianity in the armed forces. And in fact, we've done stories on this, that the evangelical movement, movement has actually helped, nurtured, promoted at many levels of the senior military command. Is there a kind of taste for the apocalypse in some of this nu nuclear war planning? Well, I can't uh, really judge that, but I have known for a long time that, uh, for example, President Reagan was very influenced by evangelical thinking. Possibly, well, Jimmy Carter was a born-again Baptist. Harry Truman, as I don't think anyone has ever made the point that the president, Harry Truman, who on the prospect of nuclear weapons um, uh, wrote in his diary uh, right in, in 1945, this may be the fire prophesied in Ezekiel. And some historians, like my friend Peter Kuznick, have interpreted this to mean he realized uh, what an earth-shattering, you know, horrific uh, development this was. But remember, he talked about it at the same time, both in his diary and in public. This may be the most terrible or the most wonderful thing that ever happened. He thought it was very good that it was given into our hands. But I think nobody has looked back uh, from what we now know of the significance of the uh, not just all born again, but uh, a major fraction of the fundamentalist uh, evangelical thinking in this country, which points toward Armageddon as a necessary prerequisite to uh, the rule of the Messiah uh, on earth for a thousand years. Is it possible that Harry Truman foresaw that as an inevitable and perhaps desirable event? That would seem absurd, except in the context of, uh, of this, where the the um, uh, Left Behind series on uh, the effects of the rapture and the Messiah and so forth have actually sold more than 60 million copies in the world. A great many people believe that. And the current... It's not reassuring to know that many of our military leaders also may look on uh, nuclear Armageddon as prophesied in the Bible as a terrible but necessary development toward messianic rule. And the uh, current vice president, Mike Pence, is apparently uh, Pence quite is a serious very likely, evangelical. Very likely in there. And, and, and who knows, the way things are going in D.C. right now might be a president before, <laughs> before 2020. Yeah, but I must say, here we have an element that's far out of my own experience, and I'm really speculating about it. The, the issue of nuclear winter is controversial. There are some studies that have shown that it won't be as serious as the people who say it will happen say. But there's Actually, never been a serious... Some, look, very few. 
Uh, I'm told, uh, and I believe this is true, by Alan Roebuck and Brian Toon now, who are major environmental scientists now, that there is now, as of the last 10 years, not 30 years ago, virtually as much consensus about the effects of this soot in the stratosphere as there is about climate change. And the doubters about that are as few and far between. My understanding, by the way, is the main uncertainty that does remain is how much of the soot that in smoke and toxic, the black material, that is generated uh, by these firestorms will actually reach the stratosphere. My understanding is that for, uh, there's very little controversy at all about the effects of the calculations of 150 million tons of smoke in the stratosphere that have been made. And the questioning in the absence, of course, of any adequate experimental uh, and uh, verification of this, and hopefully there will remain an absence of you know, adequate experimental verification, uh, is how much of the smoke will reach the stratosphere. And there is some uncertainty about that. The other one of your proposals is the United States should declare it will not be the first to use nuclear weapons. Why does the United States not want to say that? The, um, on one hand, uh, we have allies who believe that, uh, like Japan and others, who believe that this adds to some extent to deterrence of any war, any armed conflict involving them with, for example, China, uh, that the assurance that the U.S. would defend our allies not only with conventional forces, in which we're by far the preeminent force the world has ever seen, in fact, uh, but with nuclear weapons as well, by initiating nuclear weapons, as we always promise to do with NATO. Now, it may well add somewhat to their deterrence, but as I say, at the cost of rationalizing and supporting a structure that bears a genuine risk of destroying most life on Earth. Is that necessary, either to their defense or to our national security? No, I would say not. Uh, that's my opinion, but that hasn't really been addressed uh, very, very strongly as to whether they really need that as opposed to whether it serves current structures of power and alliance and hegemony and so forth. Unless it's necessary, it's wrong. It's terribly wrong. And it hasn't ever really been necessary. Was it necessary to build a doomsday machine, or let's just say a hemispheric destroying uh, system? No, that was never necessary, but it was useful, profitable, helped the Air Force, helped R&D. Let me make a general point that applies to all of these preparations. President Reagan said, and got President Gorbachev easily to agree, he did agree, nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. What he didn't say was, it has never been threatened, or it, I should put it differently. What he didn't say was, it must not be threatened, or prepared for, or risked. In fact, at the very moment that he said that, and throughout his term, he was in the largest buildup, the only one comparable being that under John F. Kennedy, actually, uh, when I was uh, working as a consultant. But President Reagan's uh, buildup was then the largest. We're now in the midst of a third huge buildup. And uh, he continued that, despite saying that the war must never be fought. He's preparing to fight it. The reason for that, I think, is that each president has wanted to be able to threaten nuclear war, however mad it might be to carry out the threat. He did not think it was mad to make the threat. It was useful to us in a number of ways, or he thought it might be. And even if he personally didn't think it was useful, he thought it would be politically damaging for him to give that up, to say, we will not initiate. It would have made him vulnerable to a domestic rival, to complaints with allies, and that's still true. President Obama wanted, as early as 2010, and then in reviews in 2016, and then in his uh, 13, and then in his last year in office, 2016, he pressed quite strongly for the Defense Department to be willing to enunciate no first use. We, sole use is to deter a uh, nuclear attack. We will not initiate or threaten to initiate nuclear war under any circumstances. He received kickback from the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy, which makes the weapons, and the Department of State, Kerry, who uh, responded to some allies. It's 
we, we don't have time in our last year to bring them around to realize that they don't need this and it's better for the world not to have it. So we gave that up along with giving up ICBMs. Now ICBMs have been essentially obsolete for over half a century. Since submarine launched weapons became available on both sides, which can't be targeted by the other side's ICBMs, and which uh, can, in fact, destroy entire target systems, entire societies by themselves, the ICBMs have been nothing other than a hair trigger, a lightning rod for attack if the other side fears that war is coming. Getting rid of them has always been the right thing to do for 50 years. Secretary of Defense Perry, uh, under Clinton, uh, recommended or wanted to get rid of ICBMs. He, I should say, he now is being very public as an ex-Defense Secretary that we should get rid of our ICBMs. So has General Cartwright, the for, a former commander of Strategic Command, the successor to Strategic Air Command, SAC. Cartwright and Perry have both called for no first use. So the idea that these aren't sound military ideas is unfounded, uh, and yet they persist. I come back to my earlier point. No president has really wanted, I didn't say this, but I will say, no president has wanted a nuclear war. There have been a few individuals who thought that was a good solution to the contest with communism. No president has thought that. But every president wanted to threaten it and prepare for it. And the preparation in part is not only to support the threats, although it is in part that, and not only for alliance reasons, their preparation is very profitable. And that means that campaign donations flow to the candidate who uh, uh, is for spending such weapons, as now, and more significantly flow away from him if he should depart from that, he or she should depart from that. So really, no president and no candidate, including Hillary Clinton, for example, has really proposed conversion in a large sense. George McGovern actually uh, fatefully did call for let's come home America, let's declare peace somehow. Uh, gee, as radical a notion as having a peace treaty with North Korea after over 50 years so we don't have a peace treaty. Let's come home and declare peace on the world and devote these resources, not totally disarm, but simply stop trying to pretend to run the world or trying to run the world and convert those resources that we now spend as our largest industry, if you look at the Defense Department and energy altogether, uh, to peaceful uses of various kinds, health, education, infrastructure, solar energy, uh, renewable energy of various kinds. Boeing and Lockheed, if we could find a way uh, to convert them, uh, uh, would uh, perhaps change their political influence on this. Influ I think that, that may be what's required, but uh, just to say that is to show how difficult the job is. Please join us for the next part of our series of interviews with Daniel Ellsberg on Reality Asserts Itself.